Welcome to the Caltex Theatre, a full hour of dramatic entertainment broadcast over a nationwide network of stations throughout Australia. The Caltex Theatre is brought to you by Caltex Oil, marketers of over a thousand outstanding petroleum products in association with Caltex dealers and distributors everywhere. Tonight in the Caltex Theatre, you will hear The Trial of a Judge, written by the well-known actor Raymond Massey. This is the powerful story of a famous judge, merciless in his administration of the law, yet himself leading a double life. When his past returns to confront him, he finds he must be merciless again with himself. In the title role of the judge, you will hear our star, Kevin Brennan. <laughs> The Caltex Theatre presents The Trial of a Judge, Act One. My name is Britton, Sir Francis Britton, one time judge of the High Court of England. But of course you know me. You've seen those screaming headlines you've heard me talked about. The Hanging Judge, they called me. You remember, of course. Perhaps you might be interested now that the first sensation of the case of the hanging judge has died down, to know my side of the story, to know how and why I did what I did. Perhaps the best place to begin the story is in the Adelphi Club, that London meeting place of lawyers, judges and parliamentarians, where so much happened to shape my destiny. Let me begin the evening after the hearing of an appeal against a death sentence I had passed upon a young murderer. Major Gilbert West of the Home Office, who had refused to allow the appeal, was discussing the matter with me. It may interest you to know, Britain, there was no confession. He stuck to his innocence to the end. It may interest me, but it does not concern me. He was fairly tried. The rules of evidence were meticulously observed. It passes understanding that any decision as to a reprieve was involved. You didn't have to listen to Keith Nottingham for two hours last night. He's a persuasive fellow. Every case is cut and dried. Persuasion doesn't come into it. Why have we developed the trial system? To destroy the result by a sentimental whim? West, the case is always greater than the man. Always. That was my creed. It always had been. It brought me under critical fire a good deal, of course. In fact, I realize now just how much I was disliked, even by other members of the club who are usually civil enough to my face. Men like Sir George Sidney of the House of Commons and Miles Lamprey, the solicitor. I've no doubt they disgusted me the moment I left their presence in the club that evening. Lord, what a desiccated, pompous boar Britain is. Don't you agree, Lamprey? He has no social graces, Geordie, I grant you. But he tries rather hard, with complete failure. But... Oh, bless my soul, now, mm -hmm. a... I say, Lamprey, who's that fellow reading with the fireplace? I seem to know his face. Hmm? Oh, a new member. Name of Archer. Just retired as Commissioner of Police in Hong Kong. Of course. I thought I knew his face. Met him years ago. He's coming over here. Yes. Uh, excuse me, uh, Colonel Archer, isn't it? How do you do, Sir George? I didn't think you'd remember me. Of course. Good to see you, old chap. This is Miles Lamprey, a thieving lawyer, I'm afraid. <laughs> How do you do? How do you do? From Hong Kong, I understand, Colonel. What brings you to London? Well, I'm home for good. I've just been appointed Chief of the Norfolk Constabulary, which is a comfortable progression from the Far East. <laughs> yes, I expect so. Yes. Ah, oh, here comes someone else you must meet, Sir Keith Nottingham. Wacking good lawyer bloke. Uh, I say, Keith. Oh, evening, Johnny. Oh, hello, Lamprey. Keith, this is my friend, Colonel Archer. Keith Nottingham. How do you do? Oh, how do you do? Well, now, how about a drink, Archer? I'd like to, but I'm late for dinner appointment, so if you'll excuse me... Oh, surely. Good to have you back home, old chap. Oh, thanks, Sidney. Good night. Good night, Nottingham, Lamprey. 
Very really glad to have met you. Good night. Good, good, night. Night. good night. Splendid chap, that. You're looking a bit sour, Keith. What's up? I am sour. I've just read the press report on a speech Britain made at some dinner last night. Seen it? Yes, I have it here. Um, I will say categorically that within the memory of living man, no person in this country has suffered the extreme penalty of the law without having richly deserved that fate. <laughs> Imagine being able to say that when young Harry Gosling was just a few hours away from the gallows. The man isn't human. Yes, I'm sorry, Keith. I know how you feel about that case. Every case you take on for that matter, you made the best fight that could be made for him. You couldn't have done more. Britain hates me. It was me he was trying, not Gosling. If ever there was a reasonable doubt to work for, I had it. Look at what the case was. An hysterical girl. Baby on the way. She's trying to get him to marry her. He can't. No money. She stabs herself. He's watching. He's seen it. He's faced with that awful fact. The dead body. What can he do? He panics. He dumps it in the canal. Poor youngster. We all know what panic is, but, but not Britain. He worked harder on that point than the Crown, played as, as, as if he were pleading. And he allowed the boy's past record to be brought in on the damnest technicality. Yes, he did. Mm -hmm. I argued those points with everything I had at the appeal, and for two hours last night with West at the Home Office. Perhaps you forgot to call him Major. Oh, West wasn't so bad. He's hogtied by advice from the bench. It was judicial direction I was up against. I couldn't beat that. Britain wanted a conviction, and he got it. And he made it stick. Keith, I know how badly you feel. But you must admit old Britain knows his law. And he's pretty thorough. I believe he lives for the law. There's nothing else he cares about. How can you administer law without one spark of human kindness? <laughs> Emotion and the law. A painful combination. Emotion and the law. They are inseparable. I couldn't help hearing that remark, Nottingham. What? Oh, hello, Britain. It's a most dangerous theory. Sir Francis, you and I both follow the profession of the law. We have that in common, but we have little else. I do not believe that ours or any criminal law can be an unfailing pilot of justice. Mortal laws are administered by mortal men. Neither is infallible. Till the day I die, I cannot and will not leave my heart in the roving room. Very aptly phrased, Nottingham. But I have not at any time, as you imply, claimed that the criminal law is an infallible instrument. This, however, I will claim. That in this country it approaches as near perfection as is humanly possible. The law is always right. Always. I believe this. Believed it with all my heart. And soon, sooner than I imagined possible, my belief was to be tested. It began that very night, that very hour. The club porter told me a man insisted on talking to me, a stranger. I would have refused. But the name he gave awakened an unnerving echo from my past life. The man gave the name of Teal. Teal's my name, Sir Francis. T-E-A-L. Teal? Yes, Sir Francis. It should be familiar to you. I... I've never seen you in my life. No. No, of course you haven't. I've seen you, though, many times. I saw you recently in your court, passing another sentence of death. The hanging judge, eh? I think I must ask you to go. You... Oh, no, Sir Francis, you can't do that. Not to me. I've such a lot to say to you. Do you remember the name of Teal? That's my name. And remember this? This signet ring? You surely remember that. We... we can't talk here. Oh, we... I quite understand. It's not wise for you to be seen talking to me in your club, is it? Much better if I came to, uh, Moxton. Eh, Mr. Bainbridge? What's that? What do you know of Moxton? How the devil did you know about Bainbridge? That's quite a little story. But it would be much better to talk to you there, wouldn't it? Well, as you seem to know the whereabouts of my house in Norfolk, and my incognito, heaven knows how, well, you'd better come there. I suggest Friday, the day after tomorrow at nine in the evening. Moxton. So this man knew of my country retreat. 
even knew the name I used, Bainbridge, to hide my true identity in that small Norfolk village. I hoped he didn't know anything about my... my servant, about Mary, Mary Reddy. Oh, it's good to have you back at Moxton, Freddy boy. I've missed you, you know, dearie. I've missed you too, my dear. I'm glad. Come on, drink up your tankard of port and... I let's... say, is this the old tankard I bought in Sutton Thorpe? The same. I shined it up for you with something the jeweller sold me. You like it? Thank you, my dear. Oh, the peace of this place. Thank God for it. And for you, my sweet. I suppose it does make a nice change after teaching all those little boys in wherever it is your school is. Mary, I've told you not to Oh, ask. I don't mind where it is as long as you come back to me. More often, though, I should like. Must you really work tonight? You don't usually when you come to Moxham. I'm afraid I must. Otherwise, I wouldn't have asked you to go home early tonight. Oh, Freddy... Darling, surely... No, Mary, my love, really, you must go. It isn't just ordinary work I could put off until tomorrow. To tell you the truth, a man is coming to see me, and I must talk to him alone. It's a confidential matter. He... Uh, he's a poor fellow who's out of work, and I want to help him. So do run along. Well, all right, if I have to. I'll see you in the morning, my dear. Nine o'clock. You are very punctual, Teal. That's right, Mr. Bainbridge. You will address me as Sir Francis. I'll give you exactly ten minutes in which to state your business. May I sit down? I suppose so. Thank you. Yeah, my heart's not strong. Name of Teal hasn't a pleasant memory for you, has it? I haven't been out of your mind one moment for three days, have I? I believe you are an imposter. You've made a clumsy allusion to a friendship I had for a certain Mabel Teal 30 years ago. From what you know, pretend to know, you expect some gain. But remember, the law is terrible for the blackmailer, and it properly protects the victim. But there's no blackmail. I want from you exactly nothing. What? Panic again, Sir Francis. <laughs> you don't like panic. You're very severe with those who suffer panic. When you hang Gosling, you told the jury panic can presuppose guilt as well as innocence. As you see, I quote you accurately. That is what I said. Could an innocent man have disposed of the girl's body in such a brutish, callous manner? Yes, how you pounced on that. It was the action of a guilty man. A frightened boy, Mr. Justice, who watched a girl stab herself to death. The theory of suicide was preposterous. Of course. You don't believe there could be suicides when murder suggested. I hope you're right. What do you mean? Oh, I know you well. Day after day, I've sat in your court, and I've learned much. Four times in six months, I've watched you send men to the rope. I will not listen to these ravings. We're all four really guilty, Sir Francis. Was there no reasonable doubt at all? None, in my mind. My two of them signed confessions. Ah, that was comfortable for you, Mr. Justice. Were you proud? Confessions are soft pillows for the head of justice. But the guilty don't confess. They're too strong. Fright and despair bring confessions. The two who confessed were weaklings, not very likable, like you. Oh, you're hated well. You are quite mad. Perhaps. Yes, perhaps. No, don't touch the telephone. A madman can be safe behind bars, but I'm cleverer than you, so don't telephone. There isn't time. For God's sake, who are you? The hanging judge gets his verdict. Just the facts and no emotion. The beautiful machine. You're not used to fear, Britain. You've not felt fear for 30 years. But you did then. I know. Because I have your letters. Look, here they are. Squalid, fearful letters of a coward. Written to Mabel Teal, who was my mother. No. No. Here. Take them. Read them, Britain. Read them. Refresh your recollection, as you say. Yes, Britain, I'm your son. Your son and Mabel Teal's. 
I don't believe you. You can't believe. You can only think. These letters are fake. Don't bluff, Britain. Why have you waited all these years? My mother died one year ago. She kept her secret till the end. She was a fool. You remember now, Britain? Remember your terror? Now, that last one, no, you didn't write that. You've never seen that one. It was written to me one year ago by a foolish old woman, almost your age. But she hadn't had an easy life like you. She was sick and dying. Then she... she... Oh, Lord, my heart. I... Not yet, please. God, not yet. What is it, man? Your heart. What can I do? Uh, is a capsule. Here. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yes, take it. Uh, Here, drink this brandy. No, 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 no. Uh, I'll be all right in a minute. Does this thing often happen? Uh, Lucky you had that capsule in your pocket there. Uh, Are you all right now? It's, it's passing. Angina. I'm prepared for that. I shan't go that way. You can't be rid of me that easily. My plan's different. You are sick in mind and body. You should be under proper care. Don't try kindness, Sir Francis. That's no part of you. I know because I'm just like you. Just as cold, just as bitter, as ruthless. It's in the family, you see. Why have you waited a year to see me? I wasn't ready. I've been preparing my first and only case, the Britain case. And it's a good one. I'm prosecutor and judge. And you, Mr. Justice, are in the dock. You're indicted for the crime of being without a soul, for the crime of being unloved, for the crime of being without faith, not even in your law. Have you ever had tears in your eyes? The only emotion you ever had was in the writing of those letters. Emotion? No. Panic? You've panicked before, and you will again. You've missed that feeling since, haven't you, Mr. Justice? No feelings left, and just a brain, just reason. That's too bad. It's a crime to be like that. But I can help you, and I will. Filial gratitude, my father. I can give you that feeling of panic and terror that you've always scorned, and I will. Stop! For I hate you, Britain, because you're like me, because you gave me life. I loathe you beyond man's belief. I deal, deal. Quick, quick, there's a capsule in my waistcoat pocket. The right one. Where? Oh, yes, see? Yes, I have it. Give it to me. Put... Put it into my mouth. Into my mouth. Here. Now swallow this. Wash it down. Uh, have you swallowed the capsule? Yes. I've swallowed it. Thank you. Why, you... You're... Yes. Yes, I'm all right. There's nothing wrong with my heart. But that capsule was poison. Poison? Yes, and you gave it to me. You put it into my mouth with your own hands. You poisoned me. In a few minutes, a few short moments, I'll be dead here in your house, and you did it. And that's murder, Mr. Justice Britton. Murder. Hey, and now what'll you do, eh? I wonder. I wonder. <laughs> Lines in every paper. Suspected murder at Moxton. Body found in well. Police seat mystery man Bainbridge. Mm, well, once I arrive back in London, they'll never imagine that. Why, I... hello, Britain. What? Oh, why, Ronald Pond. Well, I didn't expect to see you on this train. Ah, reading this Moxton murder case, eh? Looks like a blackmail job to me. I remember I once defended in a rather similar case. I doubt if it's blackmail. Probably with the victim's heart weakness, it was natural causes. Oh, no. Even in fiction, heart attacks aren't timed to occur conveniently on the parapets of wells. Anyway, I've seen no mention of the dead man having a weak heart. I... I seem to remember something to that effect. Uh, when is the inquest? A Friday, I believe. There's no autopsy report on the body yet. I say, you'll be on circuit in the auto, won't you? It'd be interesting if you had to try the Bainbridge case, wouldn't it? It would be, Pond. Very interesting.
Hello, Archer. I'm surprised to see you in the club today. As Chief Constable of Norfolk, I thought you'd be up to your eyes in this body in the well business. So I am, Sidney, so I am. I'm in London now to confer with Scotland Yard about it. I'm pretty sure this missing man, Bainbridge, is our murderer. Tell me about him. Nobody seems to know much about him in the district. He's a school teacher when he goes there on vacations. He had a rather unsavoury reputation as far as his servant was concerned. What about this fellow Teal, who was found in the well? Another mystery man. We only know he was Bainbridge's first visitor ever. Disappeared the day he went to see Bainbridge. Found, 19 days later, at the bottom of the well. But death wasn't from drowning. No water in the lungs. And apparently not from bashing, either. He only had superficial marks from the drop. We're still waiting for a post-mortem report on the stomach. What did you find on the body? I... Well, I, I shouldn't do this, but... Uh... Well, look at these photo stats. They were found in a sort of secret pocket in Teal's coat. Wrapped in oil skin, so they're not too badly damaged. First one's a copy of a birth certificate. Notice the parents' names. Francis Mabel Teal. Frederick Bainbridge. Well. And the date. Some 30 years ago. About Teal's age, according to the doctor. The others are photostats of a series of letters about the same period. And they tell a sordid little story. All from Bainbridge to a woman Teal. Love letters first, then a couple expressing shock at the news that she's expecting a child. Then annoyance when she apparently told him that she wouldn't do anything to prevent it. And finally, a week later, this. My dear Mabel, I am shocked and surprised. I must repudiate all responsibility, and so on, so on. I think it would be undesirable for us to meet again. Sincerely, F.B. A dirty dog. I see why you want to find your elusive Bainbridge. Swine. Was he questioned at all between the time Teal was reported missing and the finding of his body in the well in Bainbridge's garden? Oh, Lord, yes. I went to see him myself. What's he like? Rather fine-looking chap, rising 60, I should think. Acts like a man used to authority. Rather truculent. Following day, he disappeared, Stuart, and we can't find any trace... Time, Good Lord. What's up? Look. Coming into the club now. Hmm? Oh, that's Sir Francis Britton, High Court Judge. But... Haven't you I... met him? I'll call him over. Oh, Judge... Hmm? Oh, hello, Sidney. This is Colonel Archer. He's trying to drum up some business for you. I... Uh, um, how do you do? I believe we've met before, Sir Francis. Uh, really? I don't remember. No? Uh, oh, of course, it was at Moxton. You came to see me about the disappearance of that poor vagrant... Uh, what was his name? Teal. Yes, yes, Teal. I can understand the Colonel's confusion, Sidney. He met me at my Norfolk house under the name of Bainbridge, which I used to ensure privacy during my leisure time. Good God. I'm glad you've admitted that. Sir Francis, this is a very unpleasant task for me. I must ask you to accompany me to Scotland Yard for questioning on the matter of the death of John Teal. I realise my position is an equivocal one. One pays dearly for the privilege of privacy, doesn't one? I prefer to say nothing at this stage. My solicitor, Sir Ronald Pond, is in the club at this moment. I should like to consult him before anything further is done. Very well. Thank you very much, Colonel Archer. Thank you very much, Major West. I appreciate your cooperation. Well, it's quite all right. I'll be around straight away. Yes, thank you. Goodbye. Well, Francis, we've dodged a rather ugly situation, rather neatly, I think. West at the Home Office has just promised that the police will hold their hand as far as you're concerned, for the time being. Hold their hand? Damnation, Pond, you talk as if there were a case against me. Now, steady, Francis. I realise you're innocent, but since you admit you are Bainbridge, there is a case against you. How strong, we don't know. But West will be here in a few minutes. It's intolerable that I should have been subjected to that humiliating experience with Archer. I'd swallow my indignation if I were you. I must be clear about one thing before West comes. When the report came out that the body had been found, why didn't you go to the police? Such an action would have made your position quite secure. I... I had already told Archer all I knew. I felt sure my identity as Bainbridge could never be traced to me as Britain. I couldn't have foreseen this confounded encounter with Archer in the club. I see. It was a bad mistake. But not necessarily evidence of guilt. Similar circumstances have sometimes been so interpreted from the bench, Francis. What the devil do you mean, Pond? I'm not on trial. We'll try to see to it that you won't be. 
What did you say to Archer when he questioned you about the missing man at Moxton? I merely gave a brief account of Teal's visit to me. That he was a man who had done me a service some years ago, and that I'd since given him financial help occasionally. Mm. I described him as being extremely overwrought at the time. I think I mentioned the possibility of suicide being in his mind. Well, we must wait until West arrives and lets us know what sort of case the police think they have against you. Well, there's no question, Britain, that the police have a sort of case against you, uh, Bainbridge. But uh, it will not be pressed at this time. I don't like that, West. What is the case, Major? The main points are that the man died of cyanide poisoning. What's that? Poison? Home office analyst report just came in. And some letters were found on the body. What is this? They could... Uh, go on. They seem to point to a blackmail attempt against Bainbridge, which implies a possible motive for Bainbridge to get rid of the fellow. Not a strong case, I'd say. Well, fellows of the Yard is inclined to agree. He thinks the facts rather indicate suicide. So you're having them hold off Sir Francis, Major? Yes. It would be appalling to subject the judge to the humiliation of clearing himself, when the chances are that the case, after all, is uh, suicide. What of the inquest? Oh, on no account must you appear. I see no reason on God's earth to drag you through the mud defending yourself, and a scandal to the bench must be avoided. Britain, Britain, have you seen this in the stop press of the globe? What is it, Lamprey? Listen, the missing man Bainbridge in the body in the well case has been identified as Sir Francis Britain, the High Court judge. Good Lord, somebody's talked. But who? Sidney did it. Sir George Sidney? But why? Because he hates me. I have given judgments against his interest in industrial cases. And he was present when Archer recognized me. Gentlemen, I shall attend the inquest and present the facts as I know them. This is the BBC. Here is the special news bulletin. In the House of Commons, the Prime Minister has offered time for a debate and a free vote on the question of the removal of Justice Sir Francis Britton from the bench. The motion for Britain's removal was vehemently proposed by Sir George Sidney. The date set for the debate in the House is the day after tomorrow. Lemtre, where's Britain? I can't find him. He's not at his house or here in the club. I've got to tell him if he's not out of the country by midnight, he's to be arrested. What? But pardon the government's discussing the whole business the day after tomorrow. Nothing can happen till then. That's all changed. The Britain case is open again. Good Lord, but he can't run away. He must stay and fight it. The police have a strong case. I've discovered off the record that they found some cyanide crystals on the carpet in his house at Moxton. He's got to get out of the country. I've withdrawn his securities from the bank, got him a place on the 11.30 plane for Amsterdam, and his passport is in order. I've had this flight in mind since the first sign of trouble. But if Britain runs away, his career's finished. Besides, they can always extradite him. His career's over anyway. But he can rest assured that once he's abroad, they'll let him alone. They won't want to wash any high court dirty linen in public, oh, so... Oh, there you are, Pond. I've been looking for you. Ah, oh, Britain, you've been looking for me. Where the devil have you been since I called you at six? It's now 10.30. Be calm, Pond. I've heard about this debate on removing me from the bench. I can't stand that, Pond. I've made up my mind... Listen to me, Francis. There isn't a second to lose. There will be no debate. We haven't a friend left. You have until midnight to leave the country. If you don't, the police will act on the original warrant. I have a ticket for the 11.30 plane from Croydon to Amsterdam. You've less than an hour to get to the airport. I have made up my mind. I will I'm not... sorry, Francis. I've just come from the Home Office. It's the best they can do. You have West's personal promise there will be no arrest before midnight. No, Pond. Why should I give in and run? I'll face it out here, ridiculous as the charge is. The law must take its course. I'm sick of all this. I have no alternative but to give myself up. I have faith in the law. My life is in no danger, but my future is at stake. You have no future if you remain here. If I stand my trial under English law, I would embarrass the government. Is that it? Francis, I hope not to have to tell you this, but... Well, bluntly, if you stand your trial, the Crown will be very unpleasant about that Servant girl of yours. Mary. They'd go as far as that. And you know what the newspapers would do about it. Francis, you owe it to your own profession. 
There are times when individual interests must go by the board. Can't you see that? I'll accept your suggestion, Bond. I will leave the country before midnight. So there it is, Sydney. We've got a complete case against Britain. A prima facie case of poisoning. Definitely not suicide. We can establish motive. The dead man attempted blackmail. And we can prove opportunity. And now, a final piece of evidence has just turned up tonight. What's that, Archer? The club porter has recalled that about a month ago, a man called to see Britain here in the club. Gave his name as Teal, even spelt it T-E-A-L. What? Then, then that means... It means, my dear Nottingham, that we now know that Britain definitely knew the identity of his visitor at Moxton, and probably the purpose of his visit. From there, it will be simple to prove premeditation of the crime. Hells, bells. Britain's hung many a poor wretch with half the case you've got against him. But what's the use of all this, knowing all this, when Britain's being allowed to quietly sneak out of the country before midnight? Come, Keith, you don't give sufficient credit to me as a hound of the law. You, Sidney? Me. When I learned that our dear Home Secretary had agreed to a European sanctuary for friend Britain, and had borrowed the First Lord's telescope to clap to his blind eye as far as the 11.30 plane from Croydon was concerned, I took the necessary steps to prevent the defeat of justice. What the devil are you getting at? Archer knows. Archer, where are Inspector Vincent and Sergeant Scotton at this moment? Exactly 11.30. They've trailed Britain to Croydon. They'll be there now. Of course, they've been given orders not to lay a hand on him before midnight. And by midnight, he'll be well on his way to Holland, right out of reach. <laughs> My dear Nottingham, the 11.30 plane from Croydon has a choked feed pipe. What? How do you know? I'm not a director of Imperial Airlines for nothing. It takes a devil of a long time to unchoke a feed pipe. At precisely one minute past midnight, Sir Francis Britton will be arrested at Croydon Airport for the murder of John Teal. And so the curtain falls on Act One of tonight's Caltex play, The Trial of a Judge. Next time you fill your tank with gasoline, fill up with new power, new performance, new economy. Fill up with Caltex Butane Boosted Gasoline. That's the gasoline made to take better care of your car's performance. Designed for today's faster pace. Caltex Butane Boosted Gasoline at the sign of the Caltex Star, where we take better care of your car. The Caltex Theatre now presents Kevin Brennan in The Trial of a Judge, Act Two. Midnight. What is wrong with that plane? Ladies and gentlemen, your attention please. The flight which was scheduled for 11.30 is now ready to leave. The passengers kindly board the aircraft for flight K-372 for Amsterdam. Oh, thank heaven, just Ladies in time. Your Only just. Your ticket, please. Here you are. Thank 11, you, sir. Now ready to leave. Seat number 17 on the, the left. Just a minute. The aircraft for flight K-372 Sir Francis for Britton? Yes? Francis Britton, you are under arrest on the charge of murder. I warn you that anything you say may be used in evidence. Come with me. Bond, I'm tired. Three days of this trial, it's been a load. Yes. Anyway, the crown's finished now. Lemtre, mm -hmm. what would you think Britain has on his mind to prompt him to send for us? A length of hemp rope, I imagine. We've waited a long while in his cold visitor's room. I hate iron bars and stone. Oh, where the devil can Britain be? Somewhere in this jail, unless he's a phenomenally skillful athlete. If only he hadn't made me admit those letters. And those cyanide crystals on the carpet are going to be hard to get past. Britain's honesty is our main hope. He seemed to impress the jury by not trying to conceal anything. Ah, oh, the guard's bringing in now. Hello, Francis. I don't think we did too badly today. Don't pretend. 
It's an appallingly strong case against me. The Crown will grind me to pieces with those letters. Then why didn't you let us fight them? We had a handwriting expert. Because the truth is that I did write them. My only defence must be the truth. Lamprey, remember that. Teal committed suicide. Yes, yes, that's a defence theory. But hypothetical solutions... It isn't not... hypothetical. No, it isn't. I tell you now I have committed perjury. Teal did not leave my house alive. I saw him die. You what? You don't know what you said. He had two seizures. Attacks of apparently violent pain. During the first, he took a tablet. A capsule from his left-hand pocket, which seemed to relieve him. He explained he had angina pectoris. A second seizure came. He was helpless. He asked me to administer another capsule. I did so. He made me take it from his right-hand pocket and put it in his mouth. That was the poison. He'd planned it all. He was dead in a few minutes. Good Lord. What happened after he died? I thought what to do for a long time. First, I wanted to phone the police, but I thought... I didn't do that. I examined the body. I made sure he was dead, and then I took the letters he had shown me and burned them. And then, long afterwards, I dragged the body out to the well and dropped it in. You didn't find the wallet with the copies of the letters? No, of course not. Why on earth didn't you call the police? Can't you see? I have persuaded juries to send men to the gallows for such acts. Brutish and deliberate, I have called it. Yet I could have told them what panic does to men. Panic made me write a letter once. You heard it read in court. Panic isn't a sudden horror, not always. It can be a creeping thing. I watched Teal's body most of the night. I dropped it into the well at four in the morning. Sometimes I had the telephone in my hand, but gradually it became too late to telephone. You may not believe me nor understand me. Go on. Fear gave place to reason. I was Frederick Bainbridge as I stared at that body. It was Bainbridge who was in danger, not Britain. I still could flee to the safety of my own name. That is why I followed the course of the cheap killer. I believed it. Francis, you must know that this throws our whole defence out the window. It's the truth, Pond. Now it's only the truth. Why have you waited so long to tell us of this, this fact? How many times have I asked that question? Ask it of some quivering wretch like myself. It's a stupid question and unanswerable. Coming at this point, you know it must go against you. Why don't you let... My you... only hope is to prove Teal died by his own intention and I saw him die. I do not believe the truth can ever convict an innocent man in this country, under the law of England. Colonel uh, there, Nottingham. Sorry to ask you to meet me here at the club and then keep you waiting. Oh, that's all right, Sidney. Glad of a bit of relaxation. Prosecuting Britain has been a strenuous job so far. Uh, what kept you, anyway? I had to stop at Chelmsford to visit the laboratories of United Chemicals. That's why I want to see you. Well, what have I got to do with United Chemicals? Leading question, old boy. Bad examination. You should know better. Let the witness ramble on in his own inimitable way. Oh, Sidney, for heaven's A sake. A bit edgy, eh? Is it possible that Britain's latest fantasy disturbed you? As it did me? You mean his story of suicide? Seeing Teal die? You think I used the right word? Fantasy? The right word, yes. I do believe it, of course. But I'd, I'd rather not discuss this. You'd I... be wise to, my dear Heath. At any moment, I may disclose a fact. And what lawyer can resist a big, succulent fact? What fact? First, an opinion that may interest you. I, for one, probably the only one, happen to believe Britain's story. What? Do you believe Britain? Yes. What guilty man could make up that fairy tale? I put the capsule into his mouth. That was the poison I didn't know. Those were his words, Keith. And he had to admit perjury to say them. Perjury, the lawyer's mortal sin. But no man like Britain could be a panic-stricken fool. Quoting Mr. Justice Britain makes you feel more secure, eh, old boy? Uneasy lies the head that's for the crown, eh? Keith, if you found out that one of your witnesses for the prosecution knew something vital to the case, 
something which had not yet come out in evidence. What would you do? Recall him tomorrow and produce the testimony. Regardless of the fact that what comes out might work for the defense? I am an officer of the court. I can withhold nothing, no matter what the result. Thank you. I was sure you'd say that. Lamprey and Pond would have run away from it. Keith, here's your fact coming up. I know how the cyanide crystals got onto the carpet. How? Just a moment. Uh, uh, will you come in, please, Mary? Thank you, Sir George. Mary Reddish. Sydney, you're mad tampering with a witness. What does she know? Mary, I want you to answer the questions I ask you, just as you did when we met at Moxton. In front of this gentleman, sir? Trust me. You do, don't you? Yes, sir. Good. Mary, how did the cyanide crystals get onto the carpet? Th they, they spilled when I was cleaning the mug. What mug? The big silver tankard that Fred... Sir Francis asked me to clean while he was away. What did you clean it with? Some stuff in a bottle that I got from Mr. Arnold, the jeweller. And what did he tell you about it? He, he said, it'll shine horseshoes, but don't give it to the cat. And what did he say was in the bottle when you went back yesterday and asked him? He, he said it was a solution of one in eight of cyanide of... Uh, of... Potassium? Yes, sir. Did you tell him why you wanted the cleaner? Yes, to clean a silver mug. And what did you do with the bottle afterwards? It was empty, so I threw it on the rubbish heap. Your witness, Nottingham? Why didn't you tell us this before? I didn't know what was in the bottle. I didn't think it was important. And then I got to thinking and I remembered what the jeweller said about the cat. Oh, sir, this might be bad for him. Everything I've said so far has been bad for him. Miss Reddish, you may have saved Sir Francis. You've certainly done him no harm. Yeah. Go along and wait in my car downstairs. Go along. There's a good girl. Thank you, Sir George. Well, Keith, what are you going to do about that? I've got a job to do, and I'm out for a conviction. Hmm. So speaks a lawyer with a heart. Hmm. Would cyanide in solution leave crystal traces when it evaporated a month or so later? Too bad for the crown, Keith. It would. That's why I stopped at Chelmsford. I'm not a director of United Chemicals for nothing. I got our chief analyst to tell me that it would. And there's evidence that the solution was used on the mug. The mug, by the way, is downstairs in my car. This is extraordinary. It may get him off but it could also be used as proof of possession of the poison. If the jury believe that girl, then Britain's acquitted. But if they don't, and she's about as tarnished as the mug you talk about, then Britain will hang, and perhaps she will too. I can only bring out her story in direct examination. Lamprey will leave her alone, of course. And that evidence is better for Britain coming from the prosecution. You clever swine. <laughs> I'll telephone this jeweller. Uh, uh, what's his name? Arnold. Bill Arnold. And he's downstairs in my car, too. If I'd been in Moxton much longer, I'd have needed a bus. You lazy lawyers. You can't find your own evidence. Hello, Condon. Archer speaking. Yes, I'm still at the club, but I'm leaving shortly for Norwich. Well, it's just gone midnight. I'll be at the jail in two hours before the time for the execution, about seven. No, no news. I'm quite certain there won't be a stay. I was at the Home Office just an hour ago. What? Oh, has he? Yes, yes, I understand. Oh, very good, Condon. I'll see you at seven. Something new, Archer? Britain has just asked to see the Governor again. Well, Sydney, I'm going there now. At this hour? I, uh, 
I'd rather drive tonight than try to sleep. I'm not exactly at ease in this place, Sydney, in spite of your hospitality and... Oh, Lord, I suppose we got what we wanted, but... I speak for yourself. I'm only a policeman. That's a simple job, but not a pleasant one now. Nine hours to go. Poor devil. Pond and Lamprey will be along any minute, I expect, and they won't have accomplished much with the Home Secretary. Good evening, Archie. Good evening, Sidney. Hello, Nottingham. Keith, you were still in the club. I thought you'd gone home. I should get some sleep. It's all been a strain. Oh, but I don't know. Somehow... I suppose they'll give him a sedative or something to see him through. Oh, yes, yes. The governor of the jail was with him two hours ago, Nottingham. He's about the same. Have you seen him? Yes, this morning. Condon took me to have a look at him. Confidentially, the Home Office wanted some sort of layman's opinion about his condition. Pond has been trying for a stay of execution on mental grounds. A couple of specialists have seen him. What is his condition? Uh, nothing to stop us from going ahead. Yes, Keith, you wanted a conviction and you got it. And you made it stick. Blast you, Sidney, I've had enough of Your that. Your own talk. words, old man, delivered right here in this room. And what has the defence accomplished, apart from failing to impress 12 of the usual clods? There's nothing on God's green earth that we or you can do now. We may as well admit it. Oh, hello, Lumpre. Pond. No success? None. The end is only ours, are we? Well, my conscience is clear. I've done everything I could. I think we can both rest easy on that score. Oh, to blazes with you and your damned consciences. Don't forget, West lost his position as Home Secretary for trying to hush up the Britain case. Naturally, his successor isn't going to lead with his chin by granting a reprieve. I see, Lamprey. Mm -hmm. Here's a letter or something in the rack for you. Oh, thanks. Must have come in since dinner time. Mind you, Sidney, Britain's being a judge has been against him all along. Any bricklayer or butcher would have stood a much better chance. Britain's being damned unpopular has fixed him. No petition to worry about this time. Let's face it. If we'd got a reprieve for him, there'd have been an outcry such as changes governments. Hmm. Just as I thought. Another crank letter. I've had dozens of them. Threatening you if you got Britain off, I imagine. Yes, most of them. But this one's for the defence. Here, yeah, listen to this. The defence counsel for Sir Francis Britain, whoever you may be, you will be right in your defence. The suicide theory is correct. Fine time for encouragement. But as you won't believe in it yourself, you will fail. Britain will panic. Oh, for heaven's sake, tear the damn thing up. Oh, uh, no, no, go on. Lies are easy at first and bodies can be hidden, and Britain will only tell the truth when it is too late and even the truth becomes a lie. The truth that John Teal swallowed poison before Britain's eyes. What's that? Don't waste time with that gibberish. Let me look at it. I agree with you, Pond. If we listen to every damn crank who wants to interfere yeah, That by... letter doesn't sound like a crank somehow. It isn't. Look for yourself. Let me get at that telephone. Look at it, Keith. Notice the signature? Show me. John Teal. Good Lord. But how could Hello, it be? Hello, Switch. Get me trunks, quickly. Not so fast. It's probably a fake. How can we verify it? There's enough for a stay. Of course there is. Hello, trunks. Hello. Blast. Rotten service. Good Lord. Here's a set of fingerprints inside, and a postscript. I didn't see that. What's it say? My fingerprints are to be found in the files of the Harden Mental Home in Lancashire, under the name of John Leet. That's all we needed. Now we can... Hello, Trunks? Who are you calling? Trunks, get me Norwich Jail. This is a police emergency. We should ring the Home Office. To Hades with the Home Office. I'm saving him from a night's agony. The Home Secretary is the only person who can stop this. Well, go and get him on the outside line in the hall, if you're so keen. Oh, right, I will. Right away. Sydney, if this letter's a fake, this is the cruelest thing you could do to give Britain hope. Of course it's not a fake. Who posted it for Teal after his death, we don't know. But it's no fake, I'll swear to that. And I'm the one who nearly put him on the gibbet. Lord. Teal thought of everything. If Britain was convicted, this letter was not to be delivered until the eve of the execution. It's the most fiendish thing I've ever known. Our problem will be to find the Home Secretary soon enough. If Pond doesn't get on to him now... Hello, is that Norwich Jail? I'm Sir George Sidney. I want to speak to the Governor. It's urgent. All right, but please hurry. Who did you speak to? The Warder. The Governor's with Britain now. Archer, take the phone. You'd better speak to him. The Home Secretary is on his way to the country. They won't tell me where. He left in his car half an hour ago. He's on the road somewhere. Archer, it's up to you. All right, we'll find him somehow. Hello, is that the Governor? I'll put Colonel Archer on. Thanks. Hello, Condon. This is Archer. We've just received a letter which I believe genuine and which proves Britain's innocence. Yes, I know it's a matter for the Home Secretary. We're getting him. But whatever happens, hold off until... What? What? What is it? What's wrong? Just a minute. You can't mean it. Well, hold off till you hear from the Home Office. Archer, what's happened? Britain has just signed a confession. What? Oh. <laughs> I was fairly tried, judged, fairly sentenced. We live by law. 
The case is always greater than the man. The judge, the jury, the court of criminal appeal, they cannot all be wrong. I do not remember, but I see now that I must have committed the crime. That's what Britain signed, gentlemen, a full confession. Hard to figure out in view of what we now know. Governor, how was he when he wrote this? All right, in the circumstances. What do you mean, Condon? Britain's well, isn't he? Yes, well enough, but he seems numb, listless. After his appeal, he was master of himself, absolutely confident. But since that failed, he's been a shell of a man. His mind seems a blank. You mean that now he's insane? Oh, no, he's sane. Sane enough for us to have gone ahead yesterday if you hadn't stopped the execution. But he doesn't seem to take things in. I should be cautious in the way you tell him your news. We're dealing with a man whose state of mind I frankly cannot understand. Mm. Uh, prisoner Britain is here, sir. Thank you, Warden. Come in, Sir Francis. Please sit down. Thank you, Governor. Thank you. Britain, your torture's over. Wait, Sidney. Yes, Sidney, it is nearly over. Governor, why has there been a stay? Why have you sent for me, sir? You have my confession. There was one reason to leave my cell. That was to be the end. That time was yesterday. Is there more interference in this case? We have good news for you. This case is closed. Just the end remains. The law does not torture. There should be no delay. These friends of yours, the solicitor and Sir George Sidney, they've come to tell you themselves. Yes, Francis. A letter was delivered to us yesterday, in time, thank goodness, written by the dead man Teal, in which he states his intention of killing himself in your presence. This letter was verified by Scotland Yard. And your pardon, Britain, a free pardon. Teal's plan... No, no, a pardon. I can't bear that. That means the law was wrong. That is what I feared. This must not be a sham. Britain, you must believe us. I do believe you. That is my horror. It was suicide, just as you said, Britain. He didn't want to kill you. He wanted to torture you up to the moment of death. He was callous, ruthless, cruel, a fiend. He was my son and he is one. I am pardoned. Even by law, his one, I am to live on. That's how he planned it, that I should betray everything I believed by panic, lies, treachery. Be fairly tried, condemned, and yet have no release. Britain, Britain, I know mistakes have been made muddling all around shortcuts, but an innocent man's been saved from the gallows. Human feelings have had a chance. Isn't that justice? No! Human feelings have turned justice into a farce. Human feelings cannot be trusted. That's why we have the law. Better an innocent man should die than that the law be made a fake. The case is always greater than the man. I was fairly tried, rightly condemned. I signed my confession one final lie. That would have been my secret. It would have set the pattern right. Instead, I am condemned to live. I wish that I were dead. My living makes a mockery of the faith I held. Teal is one. I have had judgment. And that judgment has denied me. Teal is one. I am sentenced to live. Teal is one. <laughs> so ends our Caltex play, The Trial of a Judge. In a moment, we will give you tonight's cast and tell you about next week's presentation in the Caltex Theatre. The Trial of a Judge was adapted for radio by David Netheim from the play The Hanging Judge, written by Raymond Massey. In the starring role, you heard Kevin Brennan as the judge, Sir Francis Britton. <laughs> the supporting cast was as follows. Major Gilbert West, Ivan Vander, Sir George Sidney, James Mills, 
Miles Lamprey, Lionel Stevens, Colonel George Archer, Barry Faber, Sir Keith Nottingham, Leonard Bullen, John Teal, David Netheim, Mary Reddish, Queenie Ashton, Sir Ronald Pond, Alan White, the Governor, Colin McAllister. Now this is your compere, Rick Hutton, bidding you good night. On behalf of your hosts, Caltex Oil, marketers of Caltex Super Gasoline and Caltex Gasoline, the world famous RPM 1030 Special Motor Oil, and Marfac Lubrication.